Southern Gothic is a podcast that explores the history behind some of the American South's darkest days, greatest mysteries, and most chilling ghost stories. On February 20th, 1835, thousands of men, women, and children all lined the streets of Mobile, Alabama. They were there to watch as a man named Charles Boynton was marched from the Mobile Jail on St. Emanuel Street north to the gallows, where he'd be hanged for the murder of his former friend and roommate, Nathaniel Frost. Boynton was in his early 20s, stood five foot nine inches tall, and for the occasion, he was dressed in a black suit and a top hat. At the time, it was a tradition that a condemned man ride on the cart atop his soon-to-be coffin as he proceeded toward his fate. But for some reason, Boynton was allowed to follow behind on foot that day, escorted by several groups of law enforcement and militiamen, ensuring that he did not get any ideas. The grim procession slowly meandered for over a mile and a half through the streets of Mobile, passing the Church Street graveyard in the process, the site where Nathaniel Frost was murdered. But all the way up until the end, Boynton claimed he was not the culprit of this violent act. He had maintained his innocence from the time of his arrest, through the trial, and all the way up until this very point. Yet, when he reached that fateful spot where he was to hang, Boynton attempted to flee by jumping from the scaffold. A guard quickly caught and dragged him back into place, and then as a minister prayed over him and asked him for his final declaration before God and man, he told the watching crowd, I am innocent. I did not commit the murder, and as proof of my innocence, an oak tree with a hundred roots will grow from my grave. if you ask folks today, many believe that Charles Boynton's final plea came true. As a beautiful oak tree stands by Mobile's Church Street graveyard in the purported location where he was buried almost two centuries ago. And it's said that visitors to this tree might just hear the disembodied sound of his voice coming from within, whispering, I'm innocent. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you are listening to Southern Gothic. Charles Boynton was about 19 years old when he arrived in Mobile, Alabama from his home in Connecticut in the early 1830s. Why he chose Mobile is unknown, although it was a time of rapid growth and expansion in the city, and Boynton likely had aspirations of making a name for himself in a new place with more opportunities. After all, it's believed that when he got to town, Boynton was absolutely penniless. But since he was trained as a printer, it didn't take long for him to find employment at the Pollard and Dale Printing Company. As for where he'd stay, Boynton took up residence in a boarding house owned by William George and his wife. It was there that he met his soon-to-be close friend and roommate, Nathaniel Frost. The pair had an awful lot in common. They were not only both from New England, but they also shared the trade of printing. However, 
there was one stark difference. Boynton was a strong, healthy young man, and Frost was frail and sickly, suffering from the effects of tuberculosis. It's said that Boynton was quite sympathetic to his new friend and tried to assist him as much as he could when those fits of coughing left him sapped of his strength. On the other hand, when Frost was feeling well and the weather cooperated, the two men often went for walks together to take in the fresh air. And y'all know where one of their favorite spots to go to was, right? The city graveyard. The men enjoyed meandering through the park-like cemetery, frequently stopping to rest and read the epitaphs on markers or admire the craftsmanship of the stonemasons. Sometimes Frost would even pull out his knife and whittle as Boynton wandered through the trees. But on days when Frost felt melancholy and spoke about his death, Boynton would try to raise his spirits by reciting poetry or singing a humorous song. In fact, while Charles Boynton was a trained printer, he was also quite gifted in other creative pursuits. He had a pleasing singing voice. He composed poetry, wrote prose, and played both the lute and string harp. These many talents, combined with his genteel manners and confident demeanor, helped Boynton blend in with the established society of Mobile quite quickly. And it was only a few weeks after his arrival to the city that he was invited to a ball at the Alabama Hotel, where it is said he met and fell in love with a beautiful young woman named Rose de Fleur. Folklorist Catherine Tucker Wyndham described their romantic encounter in her book, Jeffrey's Latest Thirteen. On the night of the ball, Rose de Flore wore a dress of pure silk, ivory in color, trimmed with scallops and rosettes of handmade blue lace. A late blooming red rose cut from the Allied garden at her home was pinned on a cluster of curls in her deep brown hair. As she danced, her dress caught the lights from the hundreds of candles circling the ballroom, and it shimmered in a kaleidoscope of fleeting colors. Boynton somehow arranged to be a partner for dance after dance until her father frowned his disapproval, and Rose reared to give strict and immediate obedience to her parents. So she danced with other young men. But before they parted, Boynton made plans to meet Rose when she went to the cathedral the next morning early mass. Though Boynton was not Catholic, as he professed to know religion, he became a faithful attendant at those early services. He found the ancient ritual beautiful and moving, but in truth, his attendance was in no way motivated by religion. Rose was there. According to legend, Rose was the daughter of a very wealthy man who claimed to be a baron forced to flee France after killing a politically influential man in a duel. Obviously, the baron was not impressed with the penniless printer, and he would have none of it when it came to their courtship. But, as they always do, the young couple in love would not be deterred. With the help of some trusted friends, Boynton regularly slipped love notes and poems to Rose. Then, when the baron was away, the two lovebirds took clandestine strolls through town. And y'all know where one of their favorite places to walk was, right? The city cemetery. There they sat beneath the trees and held hands while dreaming of the future. As time passed, Charles Boynton found himself thinking of little else besides Rose and he spent much of his free time writing poetry, either for her or about her. For this, he got teased by the folks he worked with, until one day, he got into a bit of a scuffle with one of them. It's said that a fellow printer picked up a crumpled piece of paper and found that it was a draft of a poem that Boynton had written. So the man held on to it until the evening, waiting until everyone had assembled for dinner, when he suddenly stood up 
and began to recite the poem for all to hear. Boynton became furious and jumped out of his seat, lunging toward the man. Fortunately, they were quickly restrained by others before a full-blown fistfight could break out, and Nathaniel Frost was able to convince his dear friend to calm down. But the damage was done. Around April of 1835, Charles Boynton lost his printing job. As you can expect, this caused an incredible amount of anxiety for the young man, who had hoped to prove he could be financially stable enough to support a wife. But now, what little savings he had built were being depleted rather quickly. And so with no job opportunity in sight, Charles Boynton turned to gambling. Though it's said that he was already a frequent gambler for entertainment, now the young man saw it as his only way to make cash. However, it seems Boynton didn't have the best of luck, and on more than one occasion, he had hit up Frost for a loan to cover his room and board. Unfortunately, these financial issues that Charles Boynton faced would soon pale in comparison to the problem ahead. As on the morning of May 11, 1834, Nathaniel Frost's body was discovered beneath a chinkapin tree near the Church Street Cemetery. He had been robbed and stabbed to death, and it wouldn't take long for the police to suspect that Charles Boynton was the culprit. We'll discuss the events of this fateful day, the young man's claims of innocence, as well as the legend that continues to surround it, and more after the break. May 10th, 1834, was one of those days that turned out nice enough for Charles and Nathaniel to take one of their strolls through town. So they did just that, and they followed their regular route through Mobile before making their usual way to the Church Street Cemetery. Then, when they got there, it is said that Frost found a spot to sit and whittle. Well, Boynton, being the romantic that he was, asked his friend if he'd make a little heart pendant for him so they could give it to Rose as a gift. Frost agreed and set out to work. Eventually, though, after he completed the pendant, the pair separated. And what happened next is what ultimately threw suspicion on Charles Boynton for the murder of his friend. Catherine Tucker Wyndham wrote, About mid-afternoon, Boynton returned to the boarding house alone. Where's Frost? One of the boarders asked. He didn't get sick, did he? He's all right, Boynton replied. I just had some things to attend to, so I came on ahead. He then hurried to his room. A few minutes later, he handed Mrs. George a small package and asked that she have it delivered to Rose. Then, when the steamship James Monroe left Mobile headed for Montgomery that night, Boynton was on board. You can understand why, after the police arrived at the boarding house to ask questions the next day, they immediately found a suspect in Charles Boynton. Not only did Mrs. George tell the authorities about Boynton's actions the day prior, but also about his reputation as a gambler and about that fight. And to make matters worse, it seems that Boynton had purchased a pair of pistols and a small knife before heading to the wharf and boarding that steamer out of town. So on May 12, 1834, Mobile newspapers printed the following proclamation. Murder. $500 reward. City of Mobile. 
upon the body of Nathaniel Frost, and whereas suspicion rests on one Charles Boynton as the perpetrator of this horrid act, therefore I, John Stocking Jr., mayor of the city of Mobile, by virtue of authority in me vested by a special resolution of the board of aldermen, do hereby offer a reward of $250 in the event of the said Boynton being convicted of said murder. Today, this reward would be valued at upward of $8,600. Well, after learning where Boynton was headed, a sheriff's posse traveled upriver to catch him. The men succeeded rather quickly, and the suspect was taken into custody and promptly returned to Mobile. Unfortunately for Boynton, when the sheriff found him, he not only had $95 in cash, but he also had Nathaniel Frost's wallet. Charles Boynton then sat in jail for several months awaiting a trial, and news accounts of the murder portrayed him as a friend who had, quote, cultivated Frost with acts of kindness and attention before he eventually killed him for the sake of plunder. Yet all the while, he used his time in jail to not only pen long letters to Rose pleading his eternal love, but also to compose poetry, some of which was even published in the local paper but yet nothing he did could change the course of what was to come. Charles Boynton was tried for the murder of Nathaniel Frost on November 21st, 1834, and the jury only deliberated for a mere 75 minutes before returning a verdict of guilty. The man was then sentenced to hang on February 20th, 1835, and that is exactly what happened. As we described previously, thousands came to witness the execution where Charles Boynton infamously proclaimed his innocence to the world one final time. I am innocent. I did not commit the murder, and as proof of my innocence, an oak tree with a hundred roots will grow from my grave. Tragically, what followed turned out to be a gruesomely botched hanging by an inexperienced executioner who had incorrectly prepared the noose. And many of the witnesses from that day reported the horror of watching the young man struggle for breath before finally succumbing to death. Charles Boynton's body was then buried in the northwest corner of the now infamous Church Street Cemetery, a corner where today a nearly 200-year-old live oak tree grows, just as Charles Boynton swore it would. Today, you can visit the Boynton Oak Tree, but if you do, you'll notice that it's no longer inside the walls of the cemetery, as what was once the potter's field is now formerly outside of the graveyard. At the turn of the 20th century, the cemetery walls were relocated, and some say it was actually to give more growing space to that oak tree. In addition, there isn't a formal headstone to mark Charles Boynton's resting place, Although, at one point, friends of Nathaniel Frost purportedly placed a marker there, indicating that the man had been hanged for the murder of their friend. But if that is indeed true, there's nothing of it left. That being said, in 2020, the Alabama Folklife Association, along with the William C. Pomeroy Foundation, erected a beautiful red Legends and Lore sign to mark the location for modern visitors. As for the oak itself, which is now known to most as the Boynton Oak, it stands roughly 60 feet tall with a diameter of about four and a half feet 
and branches reaching up to 110 feet long. But is it actually as old as the legend suggests? Well, in 2019, a local news outlet sought to answer this very question and approached Peter Toller, a certified ISA arborist and the city of Mobile urban forester. Toller said that given the size of the tree and the location in which it's growing, he'd place the likely age of the tree between 150 to 200 years old, a rough estimate that would in fact fall within the range that included Boynton's burial. He added, The tree's been going on for so long, and knowing that the tree roots aren't that deep under the ground, I'd say there is a spooky possibility that Charles Boynton might be right underneath the collar of this tree. And just to add to that general spooky vibe, according to cemetery records, it is entirely plausible that this was in fact the location where Charles Boynton was buried. Now, while the presence of this oak tree might be proof enough of Charles Boynton's innocence for some people, there actually was evidence brought forth to prove that the young printer was in fact wrongfully convicted of his friend's murder. Evidence that can be found in print as early as 1847. According to a newspaper article, it seems that on his deathbed, William George, the owner of the lodging house where the two men lived, had confessed to murdering his tenant. Oddly though, this article was originally printed in Albany, New York, and is quite critical of the justice system that allowed an innocent man to be executed a decade prior. A Mobile newspaper contradicted the story, claiming that no such confession had actually occurred, and that the New York newspaper had merely used the circumstances to criticize the use of the death penalty. But this wasn't the only purported confession. Sixty years after the murder, a woman named Florence White claimed that she was responsible. Local author Mary S. Palmer outlined the claim in her book, Boynton Oak, A Grave Injustice. A number of years after Boynton was hanged, Florence White summoned Mobile's chief of police as she was dying. She told him her conscience had almost driven her crazy. Then she produced a watch with a chain and a fob and a diamond ring, explaining how her man followed Frost and Boynton, hoping to rob them. He had overheard the two men plan to go to the cemetery, and he persuaded Florence to go with him. When Boynton left, Florence and the man came out of hiding and surprised Frost. She said she intended to rob him while he slept, but he was awake and refused to comply with their orders even after the man hit him with a club. Wanting his money, Florence took the knife Boynton had given Frost away from him and plunged it into his heart time after time. Then the two dragged the body over the wall and hid it in the bushes. Of course, Palmer does say, quote, whether either confession had any validity remains unknown. likely never be any satisfactory answer as to whether or not Charles Boynton murdered his friend, Nathaniel Frost. But it seems that for most, the existence of the Boynton oak tree is enough to exonerate him. After all, that tree still stands strong to this very day, almost two centuries after he was buried there in that humble potter's field. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you are listening to Southern Gothic. Southern Gothic is an independent podcast produced by siblings Brianne and Brandon Schecksneider. If you're a fan of the show and would like more content, be sure to join us over on Patreon 
or become a premium subscriber on the Apple Podcast app. There, you'll receive access to both ad-free and monthly bonus episodes. For more info on Southern Gothic, be sure to visit southerngothicmedia.com today. And as always, thanks for listening. Lucky Little Shacks.